don't believe that our tuition fee has gone up again. Yeah, it is crazy. I heard the other day that since 1979 in the United States, tuition has increased and the government shows less, less contribution on our tuition fee. Yeah, I've heard some terrible statistics as well. Um, in the States, with private schools, um, black student enrollment is much lower than white student enrollment because they're required to pay a higher fee for tuition. Well, that just proves that tuition helps to maintain class and racial devices within society, and especially because it is most high-income families who are affordable uh, to the private tuition, and this means uh, the only children from a high-income family, and they have more opportunity to get into private school. So basically, tuition makes school exclusive, just like Antonio de Nibrija makes language exclusive span in 1492. Um, how are those things connected? Well, Nibrija sought to control the publishing of written book, and he created those grammar rules and make it mandatory for everyone to learn. Although paying for education isn't exactly what Nibrija want, however, his idea has been replicated into the exclusive society. Oh, stop being distracted. We need to study genealogy in class. I didn't know my readings. I need help from yours. Actually, we can observe the tuition genealogically by looking at the how and why it come to the way it is today. Oh, but it still doesn't make any sense. I still don't understand what genealogy is. So genealogy is um, using historical materials to um, to understand current education phenomenons. So if we use tuition, for example, um, tuition in the uh, 18th century, students were paying um, their teachers, mm. whereas now, in the 21st century, students are paying the institution for online courses. Oh, yeah. Well, before students were paying teachers because they teach something to them, and now uh, they're just paying something which is they teach for us. Yeah, now you are understanding genealogical better, and let's look at how and why that it changed by looking at the other historical sources. Mm -hmm. mm, I don't think we need to pay for our knowledge. Knowledge should be free. That's interesting. Why do you think that? Um, because knowledge is within ourselves, and the professors are just giving our uh, materials to learn. We learn by ourselves. Mm. Do you guys know that the tuition fee in Germany is free and the government pays for 92% for the university cost? Mm, that's amazing. I wonder whose responsibility is it um, and should the students pay for that or the government or the future employees? Who knows? Uh, maybe we can find it in lecture, but now I think we should go to the lecture. <laughs> Talk. Compulsory schooling was established during the industry revolution around 1900. Many concepts were taken from factories and recreated in schools. Like the school bell. Grouping children by their ages and standardized curriculums. These things were created to make schools efficient. Thus, with the industrialization of schools, knowledge became a good that could be sold. However, how much should we pay for this good? Should we pay for it at all? Should it even be considered as a good? In the production line of schools, students pay to go to university, get a degree and then start working. Therefore, the cost of education is profitable. We are paying for our future occupations, rather than knowledge itself. 
Knowledge is merely just a stage on the production line to get us to the end goal. William Furnish created an efficient and lazy way of educating students by establishing the grading system in 1792. Thus, he began to industrialize schools much before mass industrialization had started. Today, students receive bursaries and scholarships for performing well in the school. In fact, in 2000, California made it so that students who needed financial aid and had good grades could acquire free tuition towards public institutions or 10000 per year to attend a private institution. Although Furnish's system was highly effective and had been kept in the education system for over 200 years, a grade should not represent a measurement for understanding. Furthermore, grades made it harder for students to succeed it, because they caused students to stress over getting good grades without understanding and learning the material. Is it right for a good grade to be equal to money in the way of reward? In Mino's paradox, Plato explains that knowledge is innate. Socrates shows this by teaching geometry to a young slave. The boy has no previous understanding about the subject, and Socrates does not tell him the answers. He merely asks the boy questions, and by doing that, the boy understands the subject matter by himself. His argument is that we need help recalling the information from within ourselves. Thus, if Socrates is correct, and we all have knowledge within ourselves, why must we pay people to spoon-feed the knowledge to us? We could be self-taught for free. To further this idea, Joseph Jacob Toad unknowingly uses Plato's idea about knowledge to teach his students French. He did not share a common language with his students, but found a bilingual version of Ptolemark with both French and Flemish. The students worked on it until they were fluent in French, and all Jacob Toad had done to teach them was provide them with materials and helped with some pronunciation issues. From this experience, he claimed that it's possible for students to learn from people who are not the masters of a subject. In fact, he advocated that this was the way to move forward. He saw that for students to best learn, they should be taught from someone who does not know all of the information. This allows the students to surpass the master. Given both Plato and Jacob Toad's idea about knowledge and learning, Students could learn without paying tuition and going to school. So why are we paying experts to teach us? Particularly in your university, the professors are masters in their field. How does a student ever manage to surpass the master? But more importantly, why are we paying for this thing so we can get ourselves for free? As already stated, if knowledge is something that humans can retrieve themselves, or with the help of another person through materials or by asking questions. It seems redundant for students to pay for education. However, because education has been morphed into something that could be bought and sold, today's society accepts that education comes at a price. Tuition is used to pay for the teacher's salaries, libraries, and educational equipment and materials. Because we have already accepted that these resources require payment, who should pay for them? Adam Smith believed that everyone should receive education, and that funding of the education should be based on the quality of the lessons. In the 17th century, students did not pay school for their education. They paid their teacher directly. Smith saw this was a very productive way of doing things. By paying the teacher directly, it created a relationship between students and teacher, which ultimately create a better quality teaching because the professor knew that it was coming out of student's pocket. He also suggests that a portion should be paid by local and provincial revenue because education benefits society, therefore society must invest in it. In his paper, The Labor of Learning, Alexandra Sindukin also expressed a thought-provoking opinion towards who he saw should pay the education fee. He also argues that companies benefit from students' education but do not contribute to it. 
employees only receive compensation for the hours that they work at the job. However, they do not get paid for all years of the education required to obtain that job. In fact, employees invest their own money and are likely to have debt upon graduation. Marxism calls for company to pay a portion of students' tuition fee as an investment in the company's future. Supporting this belief, the NHS in England does give bursaries to students who study dental, medical, or healthcare courses. Canada's first compulsory attendance for schools was passed in Ontario in 1871. By 1890, almost all provinces and territories had mandatory education. However, 30 years before the first compulsory education law was enforced, most Canadian provinces had tax-supported schools which were overseen by government boards of education. Most parents were accepting of sending their children to school once compulsory attendance was implemented. However, some people were angry that they had to pay extra taxes for this service. Since the late 19th century, public education has been free and compulsory for all students. Although post-secondary still requires a fee, most of the costs are covered by the federal, provincial, and local governments. Universities can bring down the costs themselves by receiving money from sponsors. For example, Stanford University decreases their tuition by 40% from sponsored research. Although government funding education is ideal in most cases, there can be some negative results from this. Students have the possibility of being used by the government for a national scheme. In comparison to Bentham's Panopticon, Public schools may be a way to control society and to regulate specific knowledge for the greater of the nation. Two examples of this are Macaulay's Minute on Education and Canadian Residential Schools. Macaulay used education to solve problems between the colonizers and the colonized in India. Indians were not adapting well to the British way of life, so Macaulay sought to create an Indian on the outside and British on the inside. He was using education as a tool to manipulate people in India to cooperate with the British. In another case, residential schools were created in Canada to assimilate First Nations to British culture. Children were forced into these schools and were stripped of their cultural identity. In both examples, governments took advantage of their powerful position in the nation's education and used it for the lesser good. Tuition is a global concern, recognized by many world organizations such as the UN. High tuition fee for post-secondary students are damaging the future generations and their success. Because it burdens generations with debt and hinders them to reach their full potential. Furthermore, it segregates society, sending the message that education is only for privileged students. There is no direct answer to how we fix this. Unfortunately, the only way to change the current system is to go back to the Industrial Revolution and prevent it from becoming a product that could be bought and sold. Moving forward, students, companies, and the government should pay equal portions of students' education because each party benefits from it. Chloe, and I believe that knowledge and education should be equal and free. Hello, my name is Clay. I believe that education and knowledge should be equal <laughs> and free. Hello, my name is Manal, and I believe that knowledge and education should be equal and free. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ilya, and I believe that education and knowledge should be equal and free. Knowledge and education 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 should be free and equal. Education should be free and equal. Knowledge and 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 education. Knowledge and education. What's an education? Knowledge and education should be free and equal. 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 